on to today's webinar. My name is Alec Cooley. I'm a senior advisor here with Push Systems, and I'll be your moderator for today's program, as well as uh, for the rest of the Green Thinking webinar series that we do here at Push Systems. Um, welcome to today's program, which is titled uh, Finding the Path from Single Use to Reuse. We have an excellent program today. Um, we have three panelists who are gonna join me in a few minutes. The first is Michael Martin, who is the founder and CEO of RCUP and Rware. Uh, we'll learn more about what they do in, in, a, in a minute. Uh, we're also joined by Pat Hoffman, who is the commercial program manager for recycling, compost and reuse with Seattle Public Utilities. And finally, we have Melanie Conti, who is an administrative analyst and works with sustainability the town of Truckee in Northern California. Um, for this program, um, well, give me one second, I'll come back to this. Uh, um, uh, for this program, we're gonna um, be uh, doing a, a combination of uh, fixed presentations as well as panel discussion. Um, and you know, the, the eternal frustration with doing virtual programs is just the ability to interact, but we, we wanna facilitate that as much as we can. So. We encourage you to please um, chime in throughout the program um, and just be mindful with the chat function in your Zoom dashboard. Use that to just post comments, um, to share anecdotes, your own experiences related to whatever we might be talking about. Um, uh, so go ahead and, and, and chat and interact with each other during, during the program. But if you have a specific question that you want a, a panelist to actually respond to, please put that into the Q&A function instead. Um, that's where I'll be looking to, to actually pull up questions when we get to that stage. Um, I'll also point out that we have uh, a number of resources that we'll be sharing. Uh, we'll be posting a few of these into the chat during the program, um, but then after, after the program, within a day or so, we will be sending out an email to everybody who registered that will connect you to the recording for the program uh, to be able to see the slides. And we'll also uh, have a, a web page where we'll have a bunch of these resources that we're referring to. Um, so don't, don't panic if, if you miss things in the chat, but um, I guess we will have those posted later. So let me start by just doing a quick setup um, for today's program. Uh, we're, so we're, we're, what we're doing is we're, we're looking beyond traditional recycling and composting, which are two waste reduction strategies that focus on recovering waste that's already been produced what we refer to as downstream solutions. For decades, we've talked, about the way, we've talked about the waste reduction hierarchy of reduce, reuse, and recycle, emphasizing the need to prioritize that first step, reducing, treating recycling as more of the option of last resort. But what generations of waste reduction coordinators have found is that actually following this hierarchy is not easy in the face of some of the cultural expectations that prioritize convenience and cheap goods. As a result, Many, uh, if not most, waste reduction programs have tended over the years to reverse that order and invest the majority of their time into efforts that are more targeted towards getting recycling programs built uh, with an expectation that it presents a better opportunity to make a measurable impact. Where local programs have implemented reuse initiatives, they've again tended to focus on downstream strategies that are intended to keep durable items like clothing and, repair and repairable items out of the landfill. Relatively few of these efforts have been made that specifically looking at advancing reuse initiatives as an upstream solution, where we're replacing single-use packaging um, and, and displacing the need for that and actually preventing waste in the first place. This dynamic is starting to change. Um, while there's always been an understanding that recycling and composting still requires energy and resources to do, and that preventing waste from being generated is a better for the environment, the crisis around climate change is forcing us to take a more critical look at where our efforts to combat waste have the greatest impact and to measurably reduce greenhouse gases. Um, so we're having to move beyond the assumptions and the sort of the vague understandings that in the past oftentimes dictated um, how we prioritize programs. Um, at the same time, communities like Seattle and Truckee, along with nonprofit organizations like Upstream uh, and companies like RCUP, are making a serious effort to address some of the barriers that have traditionally prevented these reuse programs from making a serious dent against single-use items. Um, even corporations like Starbucks and Coca-Cola um, have been coming out in just the last year or so with corporate sustainability goals around reusable packaging. Um, and 
And so all these present exciting opportunities and hopefully um, on the corporate side that, that the, these are translating to actual substantive programs and not just greenwashing, uh, time, time will tell. Um, but while, while it's fair to describe some of these early adopter proof of concept initiatives that we're, that we're learning about, um, it, it does represent a building momentum that is creating model systems that can be scaled up to work in any one of our communities. So I think I see this personally as kind of an exciting time period where there are possibilities that are opening up that we've not had uh, around reuse um, for, for many, many years. Uh, while there are comparative comparable efforts being made around other upstream focused reuse efforts like shipping packaging. Today's program is gonna focus specifically on food and beverage packaging, um, including in cups and to-go container systems. Uh, and we'll, we'll look for a future program where we can focus on some of the other examples of reuse to, to replace single use. So for today's program, we're gonna lead off with Michael Martin, who is going to uh, give a presentation explaining why it's important to look beyond recycling and compost to prioritize reusable alternatives. He's gonna talk, talk a little bit about why, why this really should needs to be more of a priority, um, as well as describe the closed loop service that his company offers with reusable cups for concession sales, uh, for concert and other venues. Pat Kaufman will follow next, giving an overview of the Reuse Seattle partnership is bringing the city of Seattle together with NGOs and local businesses to promote reuse and develop different types of open and closed reuse systems for restaurants, venues, and large institutions, uh, among other settings. And finally, we'll hear from Melanie Conti, who will give a case study about um, showing how these concepts and these, these types of initiatives are, are viable and can be done even in small rural communities um, that are not necessarily a Seattle or a San Francisco. Um, where it can be done on a local level um, uh, to be able to independently launch scalable reusable systems. So with that said, um, I want to introduce Michael Martin and he's gonna tell us about um, what ARCUP is doing. Alec, thank you so much. And thank you to Bush Systems for putting on this webinar. Uh, it's, it's absolutely critical. Um, so I have a few slides here. This slide has a bunch of words on it. You can read them if you want, but if you, basically the message is we have a single use crisis going on right now globally. And um, you know, it's, it's this, this session is called Finding the Path from Single Use to Reuse. I wanna just briefly tell you my path from single use to reuse. I'm old, I've been doing this for 32 years. I produced the Earth Day, Earth Day concerts from 1990 to 95. There were now she broadcast stadium concerts and introduced the concept of recycling back then. And then over the last, the next 25 years, I spent trying to figure out how to make that system work. We introduced composting later in 2000s. And then what happened is Live Nation hired us to come in and look at their waste system back in 2014 or so. and we. We looked at it and it was awesome. They gave us free reign to play with it and do what needed to be done. And we came up with a solution. Okay, let's eliminate single use plastics. Let's have just compostables and recycling. And we would have trash goalies. And I thought this is gonna be the solution to solve the waste crisis. And at the end of the event, we audited the waste. And it turned out that about 10% of the waste actually went to landfill, despite the fact that the event could be called a zero waste event because stuff were put in trucks going to composting facilities and to recycling facilities. What's not tracked when you say you have a zero waste event is what happens when it gets to those facilities. And in fact, only 10% actually was compost or recycled. Now, to be clear, live events are comprised of a lot of drunk people who have a really hard time sorting. And it's going to be much worse there than in a situation where you have like a or system uh, set up, or you have good education, you have good signage and so forth. So that's what led me to really think about what can we do and why is reuse critical uh, for society? Um, and um, Alec, if you could move the slide forward, please, because it's not, the thing's not showing up. Thank you. Um, so reuse is the solution ultimately. And if you guys are familiar with Matt Prindeville, if not follow him upstream, Jalik Lutu is doing a phenomenal job with moving the needle on upstream solutions. I'm gonna read this, this quote though, because it's really important. Most Americans know the chasing arrow symbols, reduce, reuse, recycle, but we've spent most of our time, energy and money focused on recycling. And we forgot that reduce and reuse are way more important for the environment. It's a really important concept, a really important point. Um, there's a role for all this stuff, but really we have to up the game on reuse. 
There's a report that I think the a link we put in the chat here, a reuse winds report. I highly recommend reading. I have it under my pillow at night. It's amazing. It basically will help you see uh, this specifically focused on cups and it came out in the thorough analysis. And so here's what you want to do for if you're using um, serving cups. The first is um, the best is reuse. The next worst is single use plastic. The next worst is compostable. And the worst by far is single use aluminum. And uh, I think it's important. It's surprising to people. There's um, aluminum is being presented as sustainable choice. If it's recycled, it's it's helpful, but it's, it's not recycled. It's a problem. Compostable products create more of an issue because of the the energy it takes to create them. And there's no foodstuffs on cups specifically, which is what composting facilities need. Can you move the slide, please? Um, and so. I'm going to step back just some basics on reuse, because I know reuse is new to a lot of people. We found there's a huge imagination gap. People don't really can't get their heads around uh, how do I go to reuse. It's actually pretty straightforward, but you know you have these these reusable items are provided, they're used, they are then collected and, and they're washed either on site or they're shipped off site. They're restocked, brought back, rinse and repeat. It goes over and over. It's, it's, you know, the way we did things before single use was foisted at us by the plastics industry. It's, you know, you think about soda bottles, you think about beer bottles, milk bottles, the system works. So a, a few definitions here. So on reuse systems, first is a closed system. Think of like a concert venue or a club or a sports venue where basically you don't leave the building with any of the items that you're consuming. Uh, and it's amazing, with our cup, uh, we've been able to get about a 95% harvest rate. That means if we use 100 cups, 95 of them are collected, washed and reused, five are lost, either people steal them or they're put into um, uh, recycling bins. Um, it's interesting, at one of the venues, uh, facilities, I talked with the, a guy who was walking out with four of our cups and, and I said, well, do you take plates from restaurants when you eat at restaurants? And it's a mind shift. Next is hybrid systems. So think of like a food court. This is um, uh, where you, eat, you consume items on site and most of the stuff will be left there, but some can be taken out. This uh, reuse works well here, but it's a little bit more problematic than closed. And then the holy grail is open systems. This is where it's delivery, takeout, coffee shops, and so forth. And this is this is a big problem. There's a bunch of companies that are formed with tech solutions to this, trying to get items back. The different there's a whole bunch of reuse models. There's a few that I've listed here. One, a deposit model, where you pay a deposit every time you get a, a, a an item, a reuse item. A no deposit, very creatively named. Subscription model where a service provider, you may pay a subscription fee to a service provider to use reuse items. A penalty where if you don't return an item, you get a penalty. Sometimes some facilities and restaurants are charging a small sustainability fee to pay for the program to allow it to be a free program. Um, uh, maybe they just absorb the cost or sometimes there's city or, or corporate sponsorship that allows that to work. Um, can you move the slide, please? Um, and the um, so here's the thing that if you, if you were to step back and create a system, with, it, would, it would make no sense environmentally or economically to be buying new things every day and using them once and throwing them out, right? And somehow we're, we're in this place. And these are all of the, the benefits of doing reuse uh, uh, listed here. I mean, and there's more as well. But what we found is that cities especially, and I'm excited uh, for Pat and Melanie to talk, really feel the pain of the, of the single use waste crisis, right? They feel it because uh, landfills are filling up, recycling is problematic, composting is not working in a lot of, a lot of areas. And, um, and then, you know, incinerators many times create environmental justice issues. So um, I think that it's, it's, you look at it from a big picture, it, this really works. We're really proud of the work we're doing with Reuse Seattle. Um, I'll let Pat talk about that once I was thunder. What they're doing up there is, is tremendous and impressive and is leading the country. But what's interesting, there's over 25 cities that now have reuse directors reporting to the mayor. Uh, when I started RCUP, we were the first national reuse company. There's now 75 reuse companies in North America alone and more globally. Uh, you can change the slide, please. Um, and so there's different ways that um, uh, reuse can be activated. Here's some examples. Um, and I, I guess I implore everybody to think about where reuse is be, single use is being used in your facilities or your restaurants or your factories or whatever, and think about if reuse is a possibility. Change the slide, please. 
And then, um, so just a little, that's a little bit about reuse writ large and so forth. Uh, briefly about our cup, let me explain this. Um, uh, our, our mission is to be the leading platform for the reuse economy. Um, what do we mean by that? Um, you know, one of the obstacles, as Alec alluded to, there's been huge challenges of, of shifting uh, behavior, shifting operation. One of the big obstacles is not having uh, wash capabilities, logistics capabilities, and so forth. Uh, partnerships with cities, health departments, and so forth. And so that's really what the platform is that uh, our cup has developed. We have server, which is called Rware, and our technology for tracking items is called Rturn. Uh, so we have a complete ecosystem that works as a platform. If you could change slides, uh, the and I'm, I'm going to walk through this regarding our cups, but I'm, I'm going to say this because this is really, um, as Alex said, what's what's needed to create reuse and make reuse work. If you are an operator, a provider, you don't need to worry about all this. This is the sausage making that happens in our world, but I think it's important to get it out there to see what the lift is that's needed to create reuse at scale. So the first is community outreach for public-private partnerships. We work with cities, we work with local nonprofit groups, we work with local businesses. We create a system that will work for the community writ large. Uh, then we focus on really maximizing for environmental optimization and reporting. Every facility gets an environmental impact report of the, uh, the benefits of reuse. Um, we source our, all of our cups and serveware domestically in the US. Uh, others are shipping stuff from China. Um, you know, we, we focus on um, a collaborative shared services model. We believe that to make this work, we got a rise above competition and people need to work together to solve for this so we will wash. Yeah, one of those problems where people oh, stuff problems. need to be washed. And then um, we have a sophisticated inventory and accounting process with our turn uh, so everybody can track where everything's at. We're based in the Twin Cities where Ecolab is headquartered as well. And so we have a unique strategic partnership with Ecolab to develop the most advanced washing and sanitization processes available in the marketplace. Um, one of the things, uh, the statistic is that we, it uses about three ounces of water to wash a cup. Well, it uses 66 ounces of water to make a single use cup. This next point is absolutely critical because of the fact that it's a cultural change, it's a cultural shift. It's the training, it's the signage, it's the social media, it's educating everybody that touches this. Uh, and there's a huge effort that needs to go into that to create cultural shift and change. Uh, logistics, execution is absolutely critical. If you don't have the server you need when you need it, it, it doesn't work. If you deliver something that's dirty, you're done. So this is a really important part of it. Uh, technology of washing, and then there's a lot of hand-holding that's needed and done to be able to help um, operators learn how to, to, to do it properly and to maximize harvest rate um, and communications. Uh, next slide, please. So just in the last slide here is just uh, what we found and others have found is it really works. Um, the path to, from single use to reuse is not as complicated as it seems. It's here, it's happening. It's happening all over the country. Um, we are up and running fully in Denver and Seattle. We'll be in LA and Milwaukee by the end of the year. We'll be in 10 other markets by the end of next year. Uh, we're excited about it. We're excited about the role that we're playing. We're excited about the role that everybody's playing. Bush Systems hosting this, this webinar. Really appreciate it. Um, let me turn it over to Pat and Melanie and Alec to finish up the, the session then. Thank you. Great, thank you, thank you, Michael. Um, that was great. Um, again, I want to encourage every everybody if you have questions to submit um, for um, for Michael, Pat, and Melanie to go ahead and submit those. Um, I see you see one question that's come in. Um, um, the, the, this is the question um, that, um, that's anonymous person submitted. Um, just asking you know, for more information about single use plastics um, being better for the planet than compostable. Is it uh, because of the production of GHGs? Um, sort of skept skeptical that plastics might, uh, that are, are actually recycled uh, versus compostable. Um, is that something uh, you want to? Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. So, so several issues with that. And I encourage uh, anonymous attendee to look at the, the reuse report, the LCA that that um, Upstream did, where they can get all scientific on uh, and explain everything in detail. But in layman's terms, 
uh, the, there's a fundamental issues with, uh, first of all, I don't like plastic either, by the way, uh, we have a plastic problem, but particularly for live events, there's no other option. You can't do glass. It has to be see-through for alcohol and so forth. But okay. So with uh, compost, so the challenge with this is the energy uh, that's used to create the, the, the material. And then the fact that at live events specifically, they don't get uh, sorted properly. And what ends up happening, if the compostable cups go into recycling, it contaminates recycling, they go into landfill, they do not decompose. And if they go into uh, compost, and if they don't, if they go to um, composting facilities, if they don't, they don't have foodstuffs on it. So from a cup standpoint, they don't add any value to that. So that's, that's, that's the reason why from a, a, that application it's problematic. Yeah. The one thing I would add that too is even if you're looking at just recycling versus composting with cups, um, the real environmental impact that where the GHGs really are generated is on the production side. It's making it. And the, the amount of energy that goes into making a compostable cup, as, as you said, is, is pretty significant. What happens on the downstream end, um, compostable cups get turned into compost in theory, but there's not a whole lot of resource or nutrient that is actually contributing. You're, you're, you're essentially losing that embodied energy with, with composting. If it's a cup, plastic cup that can be recycled, in, you know, at least in principle, you're capturing the value of that material and it's being turned into something new, which displaces the need for more version. Um, but but as, as Michael has pointed out, e even there, um, there's just, it takes energy to recycle things and, and it's, it's not the, it's a secondary um, preference when we're looking at GHGs. Uh, we have other questions coming in. Um, I'm going to hold the rest of these just because I want to get through all the presentations, but but please do continue to submit those um, and we will um, uh, get uh, come back to some of these at the end of the, um, of the presentations. Let me go ahead and hand it over to Pat. Uh, Pat, I'll try giving you right. control of the cursor again and go and try advancing it. If not, Cynthia, I can do it for you. Yeah, it was there a second ago. Let's see. Yeah, okay, that works. I'll go back. Great. Thank you, Alec. Thank you to Bush Systems for another great webinar topic. Um, I've attended many of these myself in the past, and I'm happy to be on the panel today joining Michael and Melanie. So I'm with uh, Seattle Public Utilities. My name is Pat Kaufman. I do the recycling, composting, and reuse work in the commercial sector. Um, a lot of folks here at SPU doing the work to help citizens and customers and businesses uh, divert waste, reduce waste. Um, the Reuse Seattle project, it is a partnership. And Seattle Public Utilities recognize that in order to create a fertile and cultivate a uh, you know, movement in the reuse sector, we had to partner up and we needed to reach out. And so, you know, many cities are looking at doing this and I highly recommend folks, uh, you know, take the time to engage, uh, find it, your stakeholders in your area and, uh, you know, create a, a space for dialogue. So let me get into my slides here. Um, the challenge, whoops, um, the challenge that we have, of course, is, is single use packaging as Michael was describing as, as the question in Q and A there just touched on, it's the production, right? It's, it's, it's the footprint. So there's a lot of efforts underway, uh, you know, primarily across the West Coast that we see here indicated from a slide that I borrowed from one of my colleagues, McKenna Morgan. Um, this shows, you know, there's a lot of ordinance and policy moving uh, into the space of reuse. Um, Sometimes it's combined with uh, EPR, extended producer responsibility efforts, uh, but sometimes independent policies and initiatives. We're exploring different options and structures in Seattle. We're not shy about passing laws in Seattle. We have we have the bag ban, we have a straw ban. We we in Washington State we require um, you know utensils upon request, and we have a foam ban that's kicking in this year. So. You know, we're, we're a place where we will try and adjust the market by implementing a policy or legislation to do that. And, and reuse is just, uh, as has been noted upstream, that organization, they really uh, have shown through their work uh, how reuse wins and how we need to move up, the, move up to the front of the pipeline and, and cut off the supply of single use disposables. Whether they're recyclable or compostable, there's benefits in those as was mentioned but reuse really wins. Um, our efforts really have begun because of the, because of the climate solution challenge. Um, we see 
uh, in these diagrams that the uh, footprint and the production side of things for different uh, substrates of containers uh, are a reason for us to do this work. Um, displacing single-use packaging is the goal, and it's pretty clearly established. So as we engage with facility managers and with other folks across the city and throughout our partnerships, it, it's pretty quick. It's a pretty quick discussion to show and tell, you know, moving into the reuse space, focus on your capture rate, your harvest rate for reusables, that's important as well. But moving away from single use is, is the direction to go. Our partnership is, you know, broad. Um, we have a lot of interest from different reuse practitioners, as I, we like to call them. Um, these are the companies shown here on the left. Um, on the right, you see some corporations that are also very interested. And as Alec mentioned in the great setup uh, presentation he provided, that there are many corporations that have made some substantial commitments to reuse. Some of that has to do with refilling. So you'll see uh, refillable bottles more or something like that. But uh, the services, the service providers are there to do the work. The corporations have the goals and we in the city we're trying to be the connector and communicator. You know, we're trying to trying to create the conversation so that facility managers and food and beverage managers can more uh, readily make choices. These are the three things that we're really telling folks to do in Seattle. Folks, by folks, I mean food and beverage industry folks. Um, you know, COVID was a strange time, and uh, we got away from bring your own. We've we've got to promote the bring your own uh, practices again. Uh, folks need to start bringing you know, they're reusable coffee cups again with them and coffee shops need to allow them to bring them. So that's a that's something we are leaning on. This is a image here of the Silicon Valley uh, team that is making great headway in the BYO restaurant space. Um, Ditch Disposable is another group. We're happy to emulate others who are doing things by all means. Um, so we are encouraging cafes and restaurants to re-establish the dine-in durables efforts. Uh, you know, if you're not if you're not taking your meal to go and you don't need a single-use package item, then please dine in with durables. That's our message. And then of course the big the big promise of reuse, the program system uh, that we highlight, it's really about finding the right matches, you know, finding the right uh, partners the reuse practitioners, and then the restaurants, cafes, food and beverage managers out there, figuring out what the model needs to be. Michael did a great job of describing for all of us what the different models look like, uh, even what the platforms can be configured as. It's dynamic. Uh, as you lean into this, you will see there are a lot of different ways to accomplish reuse. And, uh, and they'll be different for different sectors, you know, whether it's the quick serve restaurant sector or it's a, a stadium or venue, like Michael said, it doesn't have to be the same model, but in every instance where you can permanently institute a reuse effort that displaces a single use, you're definitely working in a climate solution direction. So our goal, this is a little better visual of that, of that, uh, of this visual here. Um, it's a little bigger so you can see it. We really do see this as a, a systems approach. I mean, this is this is the future, right? This is the vision for us. But you go to a coffee shop, you go out to eat, you get your reusables for the beverages and food that you want to consume, and you can find collection containers, you know, in your normal flow of life at the grocery store, at the at the transit center, you know, at the park, and a convenient and efficient collection system that is collaborative between the reuse practitioners. That's what we hope for. We're, we, we see that, we see the promise of that. Uh, you know, a shared wash facilities, uh, shared collection vehicle routing, things of that nature. We're encouraging that. Of course, you know, we're, we're city of Seattle. We're not, we can't, we can only do so much to encourage that. We'll see how the market, you know, um, evolves and, and grows. But our goal uh, from the city side is to try to keep it as affordable as possible for everyone and make it equitable so all community members are able to participate and it's inclusive and accessible to everyone and really have it in all geographic neighborhoods across the city. So that's that's one of our goals. And I think um, Michael touched on this, but I'll just put a 
finer point on it. The first effort that we really moved into in Seattle was our Zoo Tunes concert series. That's 12 concerts at an outdoor venue. You can see the pictures there. Uh, our cup is a service provider. They came in and we partnered and designed the system uh, along with the zoo staff and Levy Concession Company, who is the concessionaire at the zoo, and eliminated all the single use cups. So there were no cups on site except for the beer, wine, and, and other beverage cups that were provided were all the R Cup inventory. We've created uh, R Cup provided the collection bins. There are collection stations. Uh, actually, Michael had a great picture in one of his slides of one of the collection bin stations where it had a compost bin, had a garbage bin, a recycle bin, and then the R Cup bin. And uh, there were a couple of food trucks there providing food, and then they have other food as well where they're, where they're using compostable packaging for the food uh, service. So. It was a great program. Uh, we the, uh, the collection uh, turned out really solid. They got a 95 plus percent diversion rate, capture rate, I should say, on the reusables. So we're happy with that. Um, the other sectors we're going to lean in on soon is coffee shops, uh, food takeout, and then campus institutions. The coffee shop space. We hosted a booth at. Uh, at a coffee fest here in Seattle, the Northwest Coffee Fest. And we created a reuse booth uh, hosted by SPU. And we invited reuse service providers to provide cup samples and, and what we call sell sheets, little information flyers on, on what their services are. We had a lot of traffic through our booth. As it turned out, just by raising this opportunity to have do this outreach, we had four different reuse practitioners uh, do outreach as well at the event. So that was great. Um, we're looking at coffee as a category, a sector to lean in on because, as Michael mentioned, it's sort of the holy grail, as he said. Um, it is a space where you have a lot of repeat customers coming to the same shops regularly. You know, people are regular about their coffee consumption, at least in Seattle, that seems to be the case. Um, and so you can kind of, you know, customers will self-select to join these these efforts, and then you'll begin to build the awareness and understanding. Because that's what, another thing that the city needs to do, you know, in this effort is really build the awareness and, and build an understanding that this is a reuse system. And this inventory, this cup is an inventory. It's not a personal container. It needs to go back into the system for reuse because that's that's how you get your gains in the climate picture. A lot of input into producing each of these reusable cups. So uh, you want to make sure to keep them in the system so that they can actually perform and get to that number of uses before it turns over to displace the single use footprint. You know, we're looking at other categories too. We have a lot of conversations. You know, once you start to engage in this space, there's a lot of interest. There are a lot of companies out there, a lot of food and beverage managers who want to understand better about reuse. And so uh, our school district doing great work. They're moving into do some pilot work on reuse. Our stadiums and arenas, of course, we're in <laughs> constant dialogue with them about next options or, or next conversations. So that we're very close to seeing some stadium operation um, initiatives. And then outdoor events, I think a natural is the beer garden sort of space at outdoor events. It's a closed venue. You won't, we won't lose any cups. And then you get into other areas where, as Michael described, they're sort of the hybrid. They're not closed, they're not open, but the cultural norms for certain areas where we consume beverages and food, you know, you don't take your materials with you a lot of times. So we'll be looking at those as well in the new year. And um, another role the city can play is collection. This is where Bush, uh, it's great to have Bush step up and be a leading voice in the reuse space because, you know, these are some examples of the interoperable type smart bins that have been created by Loop and other efforts. But in the center here, this is a bin that was in use now. It's currently in use in the city of Vancouver, British Columbia. And it's a terrific bin. It has three compartments, one for the reusable cups, center for the liquids, and then on the right, as you can see, it's just single use cups for, for recycling. But, uh, you know, as a recycling coordinator for many years, we all know that many of the bins we use are really designed by the manufacturers as, as garbage bins that we label for recycling. And then eventually, you know, the configurations and the lids and such become uh, really like, kind of curated for the recycling efforts. We need the same thing in reuse. Reuse is gonna be a different collection effort. I can't say exactly what that means, but um, I appreciate Bush uh, having this panel and I know that Bush will be ready to step into that space and, uh, 
and create for all of us, you know, uh, good bins that will function well. And then finally, I just want to say uh, again, thanks to Bush and the fellow panelists for being on this uh, panel. And if anybody has any questions about reuse or reuse Seattle, we're happy to have conversations, you know, separately or here today. Thanks very much. Alec, are you coming back? Yes. Uh, <laughs> great. Thank you, um, Pat. That was fantastic. Um, you, you guys are doing a lot of great work up in Seattle. I know I've, I've, um, I've leaned on the city uh, several times with, with our webinars in the past. Um, so I appreciate all that you're doing there. Um, let's go ahead and do a, we have one poll question we're going to throw out. If Marissa, if you could go ahead and, and uh, turn this on so folks can respond. Um, this is the question that um, we're asking folks is, you know, has your organization implemented initiatives with reuse specifically to, to displace or replace single use? So um, whether that's just sort of incentivizing people to bring their own mugs or, or if you've actually put in place a closed reusable system where people return items back to the same facility or if it's more without uh, leaving or if it's more of an open system where folks return things later. Um, and if you do, uh, I, I again encourage just for interaction, if you have an initiative, something you're doing that is noteworthy, um, would love to hear about it in the chat. Go ahead and just drop a note in there. Um, and uh, we'll get this interaction going. Um, let's see if we have some questions. We can just take a quick question while we're waiting. Um, um, uh, so here's a question Pat, for you, Pat, from Leslie. Uh, what, what are the contamination rates that you're finding with the labeled multi-stream bins? Okay, well, multi-stream bins, I, I, I think you might mean single stream uh, recycling. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, contamin contamination in all streams is a challenge. Uh, we work very hard to create good labels and good signage. In the reuse collection effort, uh, as was as the picture showed, it's really a unique bin just for reusable cups. And um, so, you know, there might be an occasional plastic bottle or, or uh, some other random, you know, carried in cup that somebody might have, a coffee cup or something that might have ended up in there. But uh, the reuse service providers, of course, will manage that at the wash hub. They'll recycle. They have recycling service there and compost service at the wash facility. So they can take whatever shows up in the reuse bin and sort it accordingly. Um, I think Michael might be able to respond to that as well. But if that's what you're asking about, that's how it's managed. Great. Good. Yeah, Michael, do you, do you want to do you have anything you want to add to that? Well, yeah. We're, we're fortunate in that um, we're doing a lot of activity in closed systems. So what we're, able to, we're able to get a pretty clear stream coming out of it. We have very minimal contamination, partly because of the education we alluded to, partly because, uh, you know, <clears throat> on the cups, it's it's pretty obvious that you, they're pretty boring and you want to drop them back off. Uh, and so we're getting a pretty high uh, harvest rate with little contamination. Any compostable that we collect, we do compost and any cans that are put in our bins, we recycle. Okay, great. Let's let's go ahead and, um, Marissa, if you can share the results from the poll. Um, uh, this is probably not super surprising, but but it looks like, you know, uh, where we're seeing the most uptake with reuse programs uh, from amongst yourselves and the audience, uh, it is with the, the less form, in, the more informal programs where simply encouraging or incentivizing, you know, uh, discounts at all on, on on, for people to bring their own mugs, et cetera, as opposed to having the more formal actual um, uh, re reuse systems for you know, the, on the operational side. Um, but nonetheless, it looks like we had about 23% about are referring to they've got a system for uh, using reusable containers on, on an internal closed system, um, about 14% for those who have open reusable um, systems. So thanks for sharing that. Um, keep the questions coming in. We, we will be getting to more of these. Um, I do want to quickly just uh, move now to our final presentation. Um, and then we're going to open up and shift to more of a panel discussion. But um, 
let me introduce Melanie Conti with the town of Truckee. Great, thank you, Alec. And thanks Pat and Michael for what you've already mentioned. It's a great setup. Um, so like Alec mentioned, I'm with the town of Truckee and I'm gonna talk a bit about our reusable foodware programs and policies, so. There we go. If you're not familiar with Truckee, we are in Northern California. We are about 12 miles north of Lake Tahoe. So we're in the Sierra Nevada mountains. We're about 200 miles from San Francisco and about 40 miles from Reno. We are a smaller community. Our population is about 17,000, but we are a busy tourism destination. So our population can double or triple on a, on a weekend. Um, and just for some other context, we do have two full-time staff working on these programs. And we have been utilizing a great program through AmeriCorps called Civic Spark to get some AmeriCorps fellows that have worked with us over the last couple of years. And that's helped us greatly increase our staffing capacity. So this has kind of already been touched on, but we, uh, probably similar to many other cities, do have recycling and compost limitations. Our compost facility does not accept any compostable foodware, uh, just food scraps. And then of course our recycling stream needs to be clean and empty for materials to be recycled. So that is obviously challenging when it comes down to foodware. So this could be seen as a limitation as far as our compost capabilities, but um, it's also kind of helped us propel beyond the compost option and go straight towards reusables. So this has already been touched on the zero waste hierarchy, but um, we, we initiated these programs when we had students and environmental groups coming to our town council and advocating for a straw ban or a styrofoam ban. And our council directed staff to look into some options. And that's where we realized a straw ban and a styrofoam ban is just the tip of the iceberg. There's um, a whole suite of more holistic approaches to address single-use foodware. And some great resources that have already been mentioned that we looked at was um, great re resources from Upstream. They have a great model ordinance that we have utilized. Um, the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality Report did a life cycle analysis on different single-use foodware products. So they compared um, fiber compostable products to um, bioplastic products to recyclable plastics and did a whole life cycle analysis where they looked at those upstream impacts of production, transportation, sourcing the materials. And what they resulted in is there's not really a best single use option. All of these single use products have large upstream impacts. And the only way to avoid that is shifting towards reusables. So that kind of became our program and policy goals going forward to reduce all single use products and shift towards reusables. So we don't wanna advocate for any one single use product specifically because they're, they're all not great. We wanna jump straight towards reusables. So enter our reusable green box program. I'm gonna talk a bit, a, a bit more about this. So this program started as a pilot. Um, we, are, we started as a closed system. Our town hall office um, has a great restaurant down the street called Red Truck. And uh, I think that's one of the great benefits of a smaller community is you know who's on your team, you know which restaurants to call when you have a, an idea like this. And so we called up Red Truck and they were willing to launch this pilot with us. So like I mentioned, it started out as a closed system with our town staff only. Red Truck is a popular lunch spot and they do a lot of to-go lunch. So we gave Red Truck some reusable boxes and told town staff to try out some boxes. And we ran this program for a couple months to kind of flush out the details and develop the structure which turned into a larger green box program. And how it works is a customer pays $5 for their box. And once they have that box, they can use it at any participating restaurant. So all you have to do is when you order your uh, takeout order, 
you request it in a reusable green box. You either bring a box you already have with you to swap out. So you give them the box you have and you get your food in a different green box. Um, or if you don't have a box yet, you pay $5 and you get the box, which then you can bring and return at any participating restaurant in town. So that was kind of the front end of the program. The backside structure uh, goes as the town purchases each box for about $4. Um, to start out, we provide each new business in the program 100 boxes for free. And then beyond those 100 boxes, we are splitting the cost per box with the business. The business can then go on to sell each box for $5. Um, and then the business is responsible for washing each box and tracking the number of boxes sold and exchanged. So one aside here, we when we initially started the program, we wanted the barriers to entry uh, to be super low to get any business interested to participate. And we didn't require this tracking uh, program. So we've since implemented the tracking program, but it's been difficult for some businesses to get on board with that later on. So I highly recommend, um, Michael's talked a bit about the tracking program they have with RCUP. That tracking is extremely helpful to um, follow the success of the program. So I highly recommend uh, anyone replicating this to start out with tracking right from the get-go. We also do advertising for the businesses participating in the program. So um, we promote the restaurants and encourage Truckee residents to go uh, go dine there and go use a reusable green box for their takeout. So some of the program stats, we have about nine business, we have nine businesses participating. We have about 1800 green boxes out in circulation and we estimate we've saved about 70,000 single use boxes from landfill. And the town, so this program started back in 2018. Since then, the town has spent $8,500 on purchasing those boxes. And this program is funded through our commercial solid waste administration fee. So um, it's, it's a small buy-in, um, $8,500 over four years is, is what we've uh, contributed so far on the boxes themselves. So that's the green box program. Um, I'm happy to answer questions uh, about that if there are any, but I'm gonna talk a bit about our single use foodware policies now. So we are currently drafting the ordinance um, for a single use foodware reduction um, suite of policies. We are bringing it to our council for the first reading in two weeks. Um, so I'm gonna talk a bit about how we got to where we are and then what that implementation looks like. So uh, like I mentioned, and this is probably really familiar for some other cities and jurisdictions on the call, uh, this all started with students advocating to our town council about um, a straw ban and a styrofoam ban and different ways to reduce waste in our community. So we opened up that conversation and started some community workshops to get some feedback. Uh, we had a business workshop, public workshop. We put together a single use foodware reduction report where we compiled all of that feedback from the community and the research that we did. Um, and in the report, we recommended some policies to our town council. So that was February of 2020. And um, our council directed us to develop a working group to flush out the policies and evaluate what would work best for our community. Uh, we all know what happened after February 2020. So this program went on a two year pause until earlier this year, we finally put together the working group when our community was able to really dig into this conversation. So our group consisted of environmental advocates. We had three restaurant owners in the group and then members of the public, um, as well as two of our council members. So these are the recommended policies that we um, dug deeper into with the group. The first is to ban the sale and distribution of expanded polystyrene. Second, require reusable foodware items for in-house dining. And third, require restaurants to charge a fee on disposable cups and takeout containers. And then with the group, we also looked at what type of business assistance programs would be helpful and different outreach and education um, recommendations. So I'm not gonna talk uh, much about the expanded polystyrene ban. 
Um, but I do want to give some details on the two other policies. So some of the assistance programs or the assistance program that we are implementing for this policy is uh, some grant funding for uh, some assistance to help businesses to switch over to reusables. So funding for purchasing reusable foodware and then dishwashing equipment. We are offering a hardship exemption if a business ha is having some insurmountable difficulty complying, they can apply for a, a waiver. And then we are requiring new businesses in town to show compliance um, right from the get-go. So um, making sure that we are getting everyone on board right from the start. So for the fees, um, our working group came up with a 25 cent fee amount, which has been the standard across um, the state and across the country for other cities that have done a fee for disposable products. And the idea of the fee is to encourage customers to bring their own reusable. Um, so if a customer brings their own reusable, they're avoiding that fee. And that comes from research that shows that fees actually have a larger impact on behavior change than a discount. So we've seen discounts at coffee shops for many years for customers who bring their own reusable cup. And there's been little to no success uh, with, with that discount. So um, this is using a fee uh, as, as that driver to change that behavior and have customers bring their own reusable. The business will keep the fee revenue. Um, and one stipulation is that the fee has to be itemized on the receipt and it has to be very clear to the customer so that they're aware of the fee and they have that opportunity to um, change their behavior. So a couple exemptions, Michael or Pat mentioned the importance of equity in these programs and policies. Um, we're offering an exemption for customers on WIC, EBT, or Medi-Cal. So those customers just need to show a voucher or proof of participation in those programs to be waived from the 25 cent fee. Um, we are not requiring the fee for containers provided for leftovers when dining in. So this is to not uh, disincentivize customers from bringing home their leftover food. We don't wanna unintentionally create food waste. Um, so that is the, the, the goal there. And then the final exemption is we are not charging the fee on pizza boxes because there's not really a great reusable alternative available currently for pizza. Um, and so there's a couple other cities that have done this 25 cent fee on cups only. So we're gonna be the first city to charge the fee for disposable takeout containers as well. So that is pretty exciting. In California last year, AB 1276 was passed and that requires accessory items upon request. So um, that, that's uh, straws, utensils, napkins, accessory items have to be requested by the customer. So we are roping that into our local ordinance as well. And then the final thing I wanted to touch on was this great cost and waste assessment tool that was developed by Reusable San Mateo. It's a reusable coalition down in the Bay Area. And it is a tool to estimate the city or countywide cost and waste savings for different policies. So um, the policies they looked at are plastics to compostable conversion, which we did not do, but it, that tool, that, that option is available in the tool. Um, and then also take out accessories upon request and dine in reusable requirements. So how the tool works is uh, you categorize each restaurant in your jurisdiction as limited service, full service, cafe, um, and all of those categories come with assumptions for how many single use products are being utilized. So uh, after making those estimates and those assumptions, we were able to come up with some quantitative uh, results for estimating the impact of these policies. So we determined uh, dine-in reusables and accessories upon request will eliminate about 8.2 million disposable foodware items per year, save restaurants an average of $4,500 per year, and avert about 4.7 tons of carbon each year. So quantifying these impacts was super helpful when we presented these recommendations to our town council to see what the real um, 
impacts are in a real concrete way. So um, if anyone's interested in this tool, I'd be happy to share it. It's um, extremely helpful in when you're looking at your priorities and seeing the real results of these types of um, policies. So here is my contact information and um, I'd be happy to share that out and answer any other questions you might have. Great, thank you, Melanie, that was fantastic. Um, yes, and again, uh, we've got a lot, a lot of questions that have come in, but, um, but feel free to drop in any more if you have not already and we'll do our best to get to these. Um, I've got a couple of specific questions for, for specific presenters, and then um, then we're, we're going to pivot over and, and shift into more of a, of, a, um, of a for panel discussion and sort of break down some of these topics into different areas. But, but first, um, uh, if uh, Pat and Michael, do you want to go ahead and turn on your, your, uh, your video screens? Um, I, one, one specific question. Michael, for you, that's coming across from uh, several people is just asking, um, you, you mentioned that our company is going to be expanding to more cities over the coming years. Um, what, what is, do you have a criteria for how you choose where, which markets you're moving into? What, what is um, driving that decision? And, you know, is, is there a way that people can engage if they want to specifically look to bring uh, your company into their community? Yeah, thank you for ask, asking that. I think a great example is the city of uh, Milwaukee, city of Seattle, uh, Denver, and LA. Each of these, um, you know, reuse Seattle was going, and they wanted to find a solution. They, they talked to different entities. They reached out to us. We saw there was a sincere commitment by the city to want to do something, and so we talked to the board and we raised the funds and, and did that there. Similarly, in Milwaukee, there was you mentioned Green Corp person James Shibadai working in Milwaukee's mayor's office. He heard about us. He reached out. Said we want you here. What will it take to get you here? And basically, he started reaching out, and we identified a number of uh, facilities that wanted it. And so we decided to go there. Um, you know, you don't think Milwaukee as as uh, cutting edge and sustainability, but they really are, and doing some really innovative things there. So really, it comes down to city support, um, you know, nonprofit support, uh, business support. Who wants it? And you know, we we are teed up to go to about eight other markets next year. And it's really, we're, we're basically asking states to let us know, um, you know, what what they want to have it, uh, what they're willing to do to have us come there. We're not asking for states to pay for it. We're asking for states to be partners with us and doing it credibly, effectively with integrity. Great, great, thank you. Um, Melanie, I, I, a question for you um, that, that actually is also probably a good segue into more of the panel discussion. And, and before I give it to you, what, what, what we'll do is um, we're gonna start out focusing on some, uh, just, just doing some discussion around the operations infrastructure. What are some of the, the, the logistical elements of actually making these systems happen, both uh, on a closed and an open? Um, and, but I, I do wanna uh, set aside some time to talk a little bit about also, just some of the financial models. How do we? How do you? Um, how how do reuse systems balance out on on the ledger with um, with uh, single use and, and recycling systems? Um, we'll talk a little bit about policy and leadership, and then if we have time, also come back to what's to me is always kind of the grill in the room with any time we talk about waste reduction, which is the consumer behavior and how we get people on board. But um, but, but let me start off throwing this question to you, Melanie, and, and then if anybody wants, wants to pick up on this. Um, what, what is the, I guess, the experience of the restaurants been like, those who participated in the pilots? And, um, you know, I assume with, with an opt-in that, that you had, you had uh, restaurants who were, you know, wanted to participate, but um, did you get good constructive feedback from them in terms of how this worked with their operations, how convenient it was? Is it something that they would, you know, mm -hmm. Be, be willing to do testimonials and proselytize for this program to their fellow um, restaurants going forward. Yeah, so I think probably the largest limitation for restaurants to join the program is having a commercial dishwasher. And um, so obviously it's an opt-in program and businesses who have that option and are interested in um, washing their boxes have been a, a success story. Um, after COVID, we also had some businesses who, we paused the program during COVID 
And when we brought it back, we had some businesses who weren't able to join again because of staffing issues. They didn't have staff to run a dishwasher. So not only do you need a commercial dishwasher, you need the staffing to, to run them. Um, but on the flip side, we also had new businesses join the program after COVID who realized they were spending tons of money on to-go boxes, disposable to-go boxes, um, after they had kind of shifted their uh, business model to more to-go operations. And that was something that they didn't plan for initially. So um, the boxes were a great opportunity to save money on um, disposable products that they no longer need to purchase. Mm -hmm. do, do, um for is there like I said sort of an economy of scale or with the dishwashing on on a if it's you know, if you're relying on the restaurants to do it themselves are are there um, just to better understand what the operational needs are or logistically with doing that on site does it require having special outfitted arrangements for dishwashers or is there a certain you know, capacity I, where restaurants having to make doing adapting to be able to add this on in addition to whatever in in and restaurant uh, service items they had. Yeah, I think um, the existing commercial dishwashers that at our businesses have been fine. They've been suitable for the green boxes. And that was one of the things we um, tested out in the pilot program. We tried a couple different boxes and um, offered them to the, the participants and the, the business in the pilot to figure out um, which box specifically works best. So we got some great feedback on um, the shape and style of the box and what will uh, store best in their kitchen. Um, so yeah, that's uh, obviously we are working on a much smaller scale in a, a much smaller community. And I think if, um, if you're working on a larger scale, you uh, a third party dishwashing operation might be necessary because you're gonna lose out on a lot of opportunities from businesses that don't have that capacity to wash dishes, or you might have a lot, a much larger volume of dishes to be washing. So there's a lot of different options depending on um, the scale of your community or your program, but this has worked for us on a, a smaller scale. Yeah, fantastic. Um, are, have there been any other um, operational or logistic issues that individual restaurants have to take into consideration or anticipate beyond simply having a mechanism to receive back and, and, and do the washing. Are there other steps that, that, that stick out? Um, we well, yeah, we have, um, well, I know, uh, related to dishwashing again, we have a couple of businesses or one business that just does to go and um, it, it's a bakery that just does to go. So they don't actually take boxes back. They will just fill boxes um, as customers come in. And that really can be any customer provided container that doesn't need to be a specific green box. So encouraging that bring your own is um, a great option if you don't have that dishwashing infrastructure and have that customer bring their box home um, and get that, that weight of dishwashing off of a business. Um, but one of the other things to consider, I think, is the integrity of the box itself. Um, we did have some difficulties early on with boxes breaking and um, obviously reuse wins when you can reuse that container over and over. So um, considering how many times a box or reusable container can be reused is uh, crucial to ensuring it has reduced impact. So that um, most manufacturers will have a number of recommended reuses, reuses per container. Uh, so that's something really important to, to look at when choosing a program and container. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I know I've, I've seen, seen a life cycle analysis looking at reusable bags versus disposable bags and pointing out that you have to use that reusable bag many times before you actually recoup the, the environmental benefit of that. Um, so, so what if we, if we can expand this, um, the, the same question to, to a larger level um, and, and Pat and Michael jump in, but um, Melanie, you, you alluded to, um, you know, people are bringing the containers back to a specific restaurant or, or what, what happens, I guess, on a community level, if you're looking to expand this on a broad level where there might be different types of containers being used or different types of facilities, is there, is there an interactive component to this if you're trying to get a whole network going on a, you know, on a city level, are there any, 
things that need to be done to try and put guardrails and make this um, uh, compatible so that you have everybody working from the same system? Or can you talk through some of those logistics? Yeah, so... so, so sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Melanie. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, we're... Obviously, like we're working on a, a pretty small scale uh, with nine businesses, and we have gotten some feedback from other businesses who want to participate but have a desire for a different style of box or maybe a soup container. Um, so different options and uh, keeping it simple the way we have has been really successful, but there are limitations for getting new uh New, pro, new opportunities on board. So I think that's really where a third party could come in and um, provide collection systems and provide different options um, and that dishwashing option. Um, but I think starting out small and keeping it simple um, is a great way to just get your feet on the ground and get your a reusable program running um, and then figure out from there how to adapt to get more um participation yeah Pat, did you want to jump in yeah i'm sorry to that i think that keeping it simple is great and for restaurants that are of a certain size and scale to just be able to manage the inventory in-house and wash them like their durable dishware is a great way to start and it can be a layered approach though that they can wash the ones that are come back to them but there can also be public place collection or you know front of house collection and and community-based or neighborhood-based collection at multiple restaurants that can be, those bins can be serviced by the reusable service provider, which, which then can take them back to the wash hub and then return inventory. There's also an inventory management service that the reuse companies will provide. So even if customers bring, you know, a certain number of containers back to some restaurants, you still have to kind of level up your inventory in the system at times, of course. So it's, it can be a combination, but it's great, I think, if the food service businesses step into the space of, no, no, well, for the ones that come back to us, and if we use those clamshells or those cups, we'll wash them because we're washing our other dishware already. So it's, you know, it's, it's allowed, by the way, the health departments, this is just another reusable durable dish item. Um, the fact that it's a reusable system inventory item is, is uh, neither here nor there from the health department's perspective. So I like... I like the layered approach. I think we'll see that in the coffee shop sector because feedback we've gotten from coffee shop managers and owners is that, you know, we're not really set up for washing. We're definitely going to be the subscribe for washing service style. And then others say, we wash a lot of cups all the time. We'll, we'll, we'll you know, uh, invest in the program and pay the service fees relative to being a member of the system, but we're not going to ask for washing services. So, that's what we learned at the Coffee Fest event we were at. We had a lot of dialogue with different coffee shop owners and baristas. Many baristas do not want to wash dishes. Surprise. Um, so they didn't have to during COVID, so, or they didn't do a lot of that anyway. So we're kind of, you know, trying to push back on that a little bit. So I think it's evolving, but to be flexible and keep it simple, like Melanie said, is, is the best way to get a food service business on board. Whatever works for them, there's a model for that. Yeah, yeah. Michael, let me let me bring you in. Um, you know, shifting, talking about the, the closed system that you've that you've been describing, um, and, and and using the sort of hub and spoke system where you're providing a, a service for multiple facilities. Could you just talk through the basic? What are the different logistical steps with that operation of of you know, picking up from different facilities, taking back with central, returning them? Uh, what, what are some of the things that people should be aware of uh, with how that system works? Well, from a operator standpoint, what they need to do is let us know how many let's, let's talk cups, how many cups they need and when they want them, and we drop them off. And then when they want us to pick them up, we pick them up. Uh, we provide the bins, the signage, the training, um, uh, the uh, environmental impact reporting, um, uh, all the aspects needed to implement it in in house. Um, then from our wash facility standpoint, we have vehicles that will pick up uh, the drop off the cleans, pick up the dirties. We have a wash hubs that we build in economic development zones. We hire second chance folks to operate it. Um, we have, uh, it's a quite elaborate system, about 10,000 square feet of a process of, of sorting the, the uh, cups when they come in or the serve when it comes in. As I mentioned earlier, composting or recycling what is not our items. 
putting them through the, the washer. We have a quality control system uh, there to monitor every item, repackaging it up, sealing the container and, and shipping it back out. Um, there's a lot of, um, you know, ins and outs along the, the the, along the process to make that all happen, but that's the general picture of it. So our goal though is to make, as I said, and I talked, the sausage making not be visible to the operator. So we want to make this, we've learned it has to be as 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 easy as single use for them to be able to implement this. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and that'll be uh, another question I would have if, if, um, if I'm in a venue and I'm on the concession, you know, the, the contractor or whoever is managing concessions, are, are there specific concerns that they raise about how it affects their operation, um, anything that they have to adapt to on, on, a, on the, uh, the sales side? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I used to have a lot of hair when I started this company. It's really challenging to create change, right? It's really, um, uh, you know, uh, operators can talk about concessionaires can easily do it or they can think of about 50 reasons why they don't want to do it. Right. And, you know, it's uh, I've, I've, I've put in, in, the, in, in a Q&A there, but what I view that the challenges are is you've got a lack of knowledge or misinformation. You got inertia, apathy, existing infrastructure got economics, and you got hopelessness. You put those things together and it's so much easier to say no rather than look at what what can be done. And this is what why change is hard. What's been exciting for us is that there's certain concessionaires that really get it. And, and it's not so much the corporations, but it's the individuals in the facilities that say, you know what, I'm gonna do what I can do in my role to do the right thing for the planet, rather than looking the other way and causing, uh, creating the waste that's generated. One of the things that's exciting for us is that the, the servers love our cup because they feel like losers for giving out these millions of plastic cups they've been giving out, right? They, they love it. Uh, we have every venue that we've operated in, both the general manager, the concessionaire, and the building venue manager have offered to be references for us. And every every building that started has continued using it. And what's happened is it sort of viralizes. Now that people are seeing that it actually works, now people, there's a FOMO where people are wanting to do it. And I think that for reuse, that's what I see happening. You have uh, leaders like, like, like Pat and Melanie uh, in the States or James in Milwaukee that are raising their hands saying, hey, there's a better way of doing it. And that's inspiring others. And that's how change happens, really. Yeah, I, I, I think that's that's an excellent point. Um, when I think about, you know, it's taken, I've been in this industry for 30 years and it's taken the vast majority of that time to get to this point where I felt like reuse was really, had the ability to start scaling up and really expand. Um, but but how do we change people's behavior and want them to get on board? And because we've got a lot of culture, consumer culture around convenience that we're trying to push back against. But it's, um, it's how we just, start to do it and be able to point to something and start to normalize it. And it's a process over time, like anything that adaptation takes, takes a while, but, but what we're doing is getting people into the rhythm and actually using these systems, both on a, on a management level and, and on a uh, personal level. Yeah, and part of our strategy is to be clear because of my 30 years of working in the music space was to work with the leading musicians, everybody from U2 to Rolling Stones and Bon Jovi, to get them to embrace reuse and model it and do it. And that actually helped to open up, I think a lot of concessionaires eyes to, hey, actually this can happen. And and that really, you know, sadly culture, <laughs> pop culture drives culture many times. And and that that's that's a, a tool that I think we, we all need to use to, to, to move this forward. Yeah. I, I, what other uh, sort of operational infrastructure question that a couple of people have raised um, and then I want to move on a little bit, but just coming back to tracking again and um, and better understanding the mechanics of how that works, uh, I guess on, on two different levels, um, in terms of tracking containers coming in, just a basic mechanic, how do you, has that done with that, with actually having to scan individual cups or containers or is there an RFID, I, not that, but but what does that system look like? And, um, and then how do you use that? Is that just for tracking metrics, be able to do roll-up metrics and know where inventory is, or are there other things that you, that the lessons that you, that you get from doing that tracking? Um, and I'll throw it out to whoever wants to pick, pick that up. Okay, from, yeah, from our standpoint, so with, with our wear, what we've done is we have this QR code on it. We have app, uh, guests can download the app, track the QR code. We've found that we like a, a reward system rather than a penalty system. So you bring five containers back, you get a free dessert or something like that. 
Um, it allows us to track where the containers are, the harvest rate, all that sort of stuff allows us to reach out to the people who have containers and ping them, remind them to bring the containers back. With uh, We're also testing in conjunction with Closed Loop uh, a uh, and, and the Next Gen Cup Challenge um, RFID on, on the cups to be able to track. And what's amazing is for inventory control is brilliant because it reduces the time to the uh, inventory drop-offs, pickoffs by uh, by about 90%. Allows us to identify if there are cups in recycling bins to harvest them, to pull them back out. Um, and it allows us to give more accurate reporting and tracking. I'll let Pat and Melanie weigh in if they have thoughts, further thoughts. Yeah, Melanie. Okay, the Liver Zero is doing a really cool thing out in New York too. They're an interesting company to look at with how they've they've partnered with some of the third party delivery services and, and so forth. What was that name again? Deliver Zero. Deliver Zero. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. I, I guess I would chime in and say, oh, I'm sorry, I interrupted Millie again. Um, go ahead, Millie. No, that's okay. I was just gonna say um, we are looking to expand our tracking program, and I think. Um, looking towards what Michael's mentioned, a QR code or an RFID, um, something to make it super streamlined is crucial. Um, you mentioned convenience, Alec, and that's what we're trying to mirror here with a reusable program, make it as convenient as possible and um, tracking the success is our main goal. Since we are putting money into the program, we do wanna make sure it is successful. So um, we're looking to improve that. Yeah. What I was going to chime in after what Michael said was that the, you know, the different, these are startup companies, they're entrepreneurial, many of them. Uh, some come from the tech industry. Uh, a couple of them I know from personal accounts. They, they, they worked in tech. They were meal delivery consumers and they didn't like the waste. So they decided to step into the space and do something different. You know, it's another COVID shift for a person. So there's, there are different models out there that we've seen. We do feel that by following the guidelines that I wanted to put a plug in for PR3, one of the groups in our partnership in Reuse Seattle, they're creating standards for reuse across, you know, this, this kind of wild west of reuse right now. There are so many different models and companies and services and, and, and you know, structures for how this is going to meet the customer that it can be confusing. And we don't, I mean, I don't want to see you know, depending on what cuisine or neighborhood you're in, you have to open a different app, you know, as, as to be able to be a reuser. So I'm hoping for some collaboration and some, it, it may be, you know, behind the curtain kind of overlap and connecting of the systems so that the, the promise of the efficient collection and washing and redistribution, at least those services that are not the customer facing part can be integrated. So we're holding on to that hope. We're, we're really looking at PR3 standards development, and we can put the link in the chat for PR3 standards um, and to dig into there. And the other thing I would say with a couple of questions in the, in the Q&A about models and such is, is take time to sign up for the National Reuse Network through Upstream. It's a great dialogue, much like we're having today. It's a terrific monthly, I think, meeting where you have over 100 different folks just like us who are interested in this and want to learn more about it. And there's just great guest speakers on those calls and it's a, it's a terrific resource to all of us. Yeah, yeah, thanks for sharing that. Let, let, let's talk about the economics a little bit more. Um, uh, uh, Melanie, in your presentation, you, you alluded to the calculator, the online calculator that uh, Reusable San Mateo offers that helps to sort of calculate cost savings and, and their stats there about how it has the potential to be cost savings. Um, and I guess I, I want to push back on that and just to, to get a sense of um, it's one thing to have in theory the the, the economics that, that come from a calculator, but I'm curious from from the the restaurants that you've worked with, are they able to back that up and say that you know when we balance out labor, when we balance out these other factors, weigh that against avoided disposal costs and other that yeah you know, they're they're corroborating that yes we're finding this actually reduces our costs. Um, I'm curious what that feedback has looked like. Yeah, so those cost saving estimates are purely on uh, not purchasing disposable products. So there is going to be a, um, a period of time where there's investments before you see those savings. 
Yeah. So what we're doing at the town with those business grants and assistance programs is providing funding to those businesses to help them get over that hill and purchase those reusable products and purchase whatever dishwashing needs are required. Um, so they get to that cost savings point sooner and um, helping them with that initial lift. And then, yes, you mentioned staffing. Um, that is a key component. Um, so there needs to be staff to run a dishwasher. And what we've seen is most of our um, uh, businesses do either have a dishwasher or a three compartment sink. So they do have the capability to, to dishwash. Um, but then that, that staffing key piece is key. Uh, so we, we haven't implemented yet, but we, like I mentioned, we had three different businesses on our working group who all have different, um, uh, one's full service, one's limited service, one's fast food takeout. So um, there are different options to kind of reduce that, the dishwashing requirements. So we are also allowing businesses to use um, paper tray and plate liners. So maybe they can use a reusable basket and just put a liner over it, a, a paper liner. So there's options to reduce that staffing and dishwashing requirements and still significantly reduce your waste. Um, obviously a, a liner is has a much smaller impact than a full plate or bowl itself. So um, there's a lot of great opportunities if they don't have that opportunity for staffing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Michael, on your end, I guess for, for the, the model that you offer um, where you actually provide the cleaning service and the, um, is, is how do those economics and broad terms balance out against the, the cost for concessions on you know, single use cups um, and, um, and how all that uh, maps out? Yeah, it's sort of a bummer that in, in, in scale, uh, reuse is more expensive than single use, you know, partly because single use is the uh, subsidies that is artificially reducing that upfront cost and the the long-term costs are, and disposal costs are not really factored into to those costs. Uh, but uh, so what a lot of facilities are doing with uh, with uh, our reuse model is, particularly let's, let's talk about venues. Uh, the, the biggest environmental impact of a live event is, is guest and fan travel. Uh, the most visible is the solid waste that's left on the ground. So what a lot of facilities are doing is they're putting a a small sustainability fee on their transactions, 50 cents, 1%, something like that. And they're using that funding to pay for the reuse system and then offset all the fan travel. So it's a one-two punch to address the biggest environmental issues they're facing. What's happened, and I believe this comes because of COVID, we've all realized that mother nature can kill us. Everybody is now aware and more aware and willing to do what they can do in their own in their own lives and people uh, we've done about a, a million transactions and we got one person complained about a 50 cent fee and we gave him 50 cents back and moved on so um that's how that's working other facilities are absorbing the cost um but it, it is more expensive you think about all the stuff i've talked about in terms of the staffing the washing the infrastructure the, the it's just the, the the quality of these of the of the serveware is so much better and somebody asked this question that's one of the reasons why we're getting such a har high harvest raise because people view this as not trash, not something to, re, to be thrown out. This is something of value. And so they look where to put it. So, so, so it's a different di dynamic than traditional recycling sorting because mm -hmm. people give it greater value and, and they're yep. more likely to- They, they look, they look for the bins, they look for the bins. And of course, then there's the signage and the education and the social media and the FAQs and all those other components that you do uh, to, to get the word out if, with the cultural shift. Yeah. Yeah. Pat, did you have anything you wanted to add to that or? Um, I think it's, yeah, it's a, we have to, a lot, we have a lot to do in building awareness. Um, I think the intuitiveness of a plastic cup is that it's recyclable. So um, it's not good to lose inventory, but uh, for those, like when we saw the zoo tunes, we found that when we would lose containers, it's usually in the recycling. You know, folks would walk up and just assume it's a recyclable cup. And so there's that. So, um, you know, the weighting of the cup, you want it to feel heavy and valuable. You don't want it to be super flimsy. Like there's a balance between how many reuses you can get for a certain thickness or gauge. And then what is the 
you know, the, and what's the performance, like the, the experience the consumer has for the beverage. That's what the food and beverage managers want too. They want a good experience for their customers. So there's many faces to this, like how do you arrive at the certain cup and uh, it's a, it, or, you know, different containers. Um, so it's, it's a, it's been a long conversation with a lot of different players and you, and you just kind of look for the right sweet spot usually. Yeah. Good. We're, we're coming up against um, towards our, our 90 minutes and I have a couple closing comments that I want to make, but um, one, one last question, it, just real quickly to pivot to the policy side. Um, Melanie, you alluded to Truckee is, is, is you know, doing a, a several different ordinances, all designed to sort of help create um, a, a guide, guideposts in the sense that sort of point people to, towards this, the system and give it a um, give it legs. Uh, but this is a question for everybody. How how integral or how essential would you say that policy actually having ordinances and other uh, having um, that component, the regulatory, how how important is that they having a viable uh, reuse system on a community level? Um, can, can these systems take off and be able to get off the ground without that kind of wind in the sails of, of having something that's directing both the restaurant and business behavior and individual. Does anybody want to take that? Well, yeah, I think um, for us on a smaller scale where we don't have a lot of um, third party options and programs to grow and expand, the policies are really helpful to um, encourage customers to start on their own and bring their own reusable. Um, and it's, it's also a huge key in just that awareness factor, bringing reusables to the forefront. And um, that's, we're working on implementation early next year of our policies. And that's the main goal of our education and outreach campaign uh, to just talk about reusables and how they're better. And um, that fee is that real, um, trigger to push customers over the hill to actually start using that reusable. So um, it's, I think it's one of the tools in a, in a, in a large tool shed. It's a great opportunity to, to push towards reusables, but I think it's just one of many available options. And um, if you're, if it works for your community, then great. Um, but if you're, if you have the opportunity to do more programs instead of policies, that's great as well. I think, um, I think either can be a viable option. Great. Petter, Michael, you're the one if you want to take a swipe at that one. I would. Uh, I think it's it's, a, it's the natural next effort, like we've talked about for those of us working in the solid waste industry uh, to look at. You know, the way we encourage folks to recycle, this is not a throwaway item. This is a resource. There's an option for that. Same with composting. Not all communities can compost all the things that others can, but you know, it's a single use packaging or it's a food and beverage package item. And there's a, there's a plan for that if you have the services providers available for that. Same with reuse. We love our service providers. We want more of them in Seattle, by the way. I should have said that at the outset. Um, we, we want more reuse service provision in more communities because we need to build awareness and build access to these options. Michael, anything you want to add? You, you get the last word if you have everything else to add. Oh, they, they covered it really great. I mean, the, the, the thing I would say is, I think you've heard throughout the day is that this works. It needs to be done. There's a demand for it. Um, there are obstacles to get it done. It's up to all of us to work together, and make it happen. Get policy, education, collaboration, um, you know, innovation are all key parts of the of the recipe that for success and reuse and we're excited to be a part of it and and it's uh, we appreciate again uh, Alec you and Bush systems uh, highlighting reuse it, it needs um, platforms like this to be able to answer the myriad of questions that are out there that have been posed and and you know to be able to uh, educate uh, people and and we, we believe people want to do the right thing and here's an opportunity if we make it easy for them great. Well, um, thank each of you. Um, before I let everybody go, I want to just point out a couple things. I'm going to pull my screen share again. Um, uh, one, just highlight that um, we will, as I said at the beginning, we'll have the recording as well as the slides 
will be posted to the Bush Systems website, the same landing page that uh, the registration was set up for. That will, within the next day or two, will be uh, shifted over so that we'll, you can find all these, um, these uh, materials, including some of the resources we've been dropping into the um, into the chat over the program. Um, also want to point out that we do have an archive of, of all of our past uh, webinars we've done on a range of topics that you can see here up on the slide. Um, we have uh, all those um, materials are also available to find on our website at any point. We um, There are a couple upcoming programs um, I want to just put on people's radar. One second. <clears throat> Um, one is um, we are excited to partner with Kirk, the College and, Uni uh, College and University Recycling Coalition. Um, they also are going to be doing a reuse themed webinar coming up next week. Um, theirs is focused on successful surplus programs. And, and you can see up here, they're going to have case study presentations from a handful of colleges um, and universities. So I encourage folks to show up for that on the 20th. Uh, if you just, um, I think their website is CURC3. R, uh, dot org, um, or you can always Google uh, College University Recycling Coalition to get more information about that program. Um, next month, uh, uh, the next program that that I'm that, that we're going to be doing with Bush Systems will be next month. We we haven't fixed the exact date, but we know it's going to be uh, mid November, likely the weekend be, the the week before thanks the American Thanksgiving, um, and. Uh, we're still finalizing some of the details, but uh, we're, we're excited to work with the Zero Waste Campus Council as a as a, a partner in putting together this program. And the idea is is we'll we'll have, we'll have, uh, have at least one uh, fixed presentation, but we want to make this more of a hybrid and and incorporate more of an actual interactive component. So we're we're going to be combining um, small group uh, breakout room discussion around this theme that will, we know it's going to have something to do with um, bin and collection programs and, and we'll, we'll be sending out details about that uh, in the very near future, uh, likely the beginning of next week. Um, I want to make a shameless plug for myself. I'm, I'm going to be speaking in a couple uh, other web uh, conferences coming up over the next month. Um, for those of you who are, who are signed up for the ACHE Higher Education Sustainability Conference uh, that starts next week, uh, there are a couple uh, networking sessions that I'll be involved with. One is focusing on BIN infrastructure, um, planning, placement, design standards um, that I'll be doing in conjunction with uh, some colleagues at University of Michigan and University of uh, Wisconsin. And then the week after that, uh, another networking session on rebuilding confidence, recycling, trying to address uh, some of the, the lingering um, public perceptions about recycling and, and whether or not it works or not. And we know that's a complicated question, but, but we also understand that there is value to recycling and that recycling systems can be made to deliver real substantive benefits, but we've got to have the public um, following in along with us and we have to give them reason to, um, to believe in the system. So. We're going to be, um, again, this is going to be a networking discussion groups about how do we communicate to, um, to the public. Um, and that, that'll be a session on the 26th of October, also in conjunction with ACHE Higher Ed Conference. And then um, fast forward another couple of weeks after that, um, one of the other hats that I wear is, is a board member of the National Recycling Coalition. And we're putting on um, our annual virtual conference on November 9th and 10th. Uh, we're going to have a whole range of topics for this conference, um, looking at the national recycling strategy, uh, we'll have a reuse repair uh, themed program, multifamily, uh, a whole range of programs. I'm going to be moderating a, the closing plenary for that conference, which will also be focusing on this same question I just mentioned about rebuilding confidence and recycling. And, and for that, that we're going to have a, a panel of, of experts from a range of different settings from um, uh, folks who are deeply involved in the recycling industry on a national level, as well as um, local um, recycling managers and how they do communication. We'll have a behavioral psychologist on that program talking about how, how we communicate and, and how do we influence people around this, this central question. So uh, encourage folks to check that conference out. It's coming up on November 9th and 10th. Um, and finally, I, I, I think I want to again thank Melanie and Pat and Michael for taking the time to um, put together presentations and participate with this program. Uh, um, you guys are all doing great work. Um, again, as somebody who's been in this industry for many years, 
I find this to be an exciting time. I feel like there are some opportunities that, that we wanted to be able to pursue for years, and we're seeing some of the first real concrete opportunities where we can actually scale these and, and, and start to adopt um, some of these reuse and, and reduction programs um, on, on a community level. So my hat's off to the work you're doing, and thank you for, um, for joining. Um, thank you. Uh, yep, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. So I'm, I'm going to hand it over in one second, but uh, uh, to, to some colleagues. But just want to point out if um, if you are looking for CEU credit for whatever certification, whether that's one or others, and and you want credit, feel free to reach out to my colleague Marissa Caldwell. Um, you can find her email here, or you can always reach out to uh, me afterward. Um, we're going to be sending out a post webinar survey. When when you log off, you may get a link for that, or or otherwise look for an email that comes tomorrow. Um, we very much appreciate the feedback you get. We we like to be able to turn around and and, and share with the speakers. So we, if you have any comments you want to share with them directly, go ahead and and uh, look for that survey um, when it comes along. Just uh, a handful of questions, and that's it on my end. So I'm going to bring up a colleague, Brian, who is from our sales team. Uh, this is the end of the official program, but um, you know, Bush Systems, we, uh, we, uh, we are a company that, that makes and sells quality recycling and waste bins. And so we're about to take the opportunity to uh, have a word from our sponsor um, and learn about some of the bin products that our company has available. Um, and so with that, I'm going to welcome Brian Wojcik up onto the virtual stage and do the official handoff. We have Michael, or if we have Brian. Thanks, Alec. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And I also want to thank uh, the panelists. There was some great uh, material, some thought provoking uh, stuff that we can take back to our everyday life. And um, there was a common theme there that uh, there still is a collection need in any steps that we take. Um, and that's where Bush, Bush Systems can help. Um, so again, I'm Brian Wojcik, I'm from Bush Systems, a waste and recycling uh, container manufacturer. Um, but we can look at that on outside of all collection because uh, Bush Systems will thrive in terms of uh, customizing bins to your preferences. Uh, if you have a specific solution that is needed, bring it to us because we have a full R&D team that can review the need and uh, you know, come up with solutions. Uh, we have price points all over the board, uh, starting from the low end up to the high end, based on, again, your preferences. Uh, small selection behind me here in terms of the product, um, but uh, again, customization need. I think uh, liquid collection would be a key. So we have some customized options here on some of our bins where there's a container internal here to collect waste. So for coffee cups or that have you, you come, you empty it out, it gets drained into the system, nice and easy. That was a, a common theme as well, making it easy for the end user. Uh, customized graphics, signage, labels, again, communications key. If they know what to do with it, higher perceived value of that reusable item is going to go in the proper place. Um, so again, we have full selection starting from uh, melamine uh, options here to some powder coated steel to pull full plastic options. Uh, we have a full bin that we just released. Uh, I, I talked about it at the last uh, seminar, uh, our Renegade, where it's made of 100% post-consumer material. So we're now getting into that realm as well. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a quick overview of, of uh, you know, the customization, and if you have a specific need, please bring it forth to us, and uh, we'd be happy to source that and, and create a stellar program for you with uh, extremely high success rate. If you have any questions, this is an awkward, but uh, please put it in the chat. I do have the chat window in front of me, so I can see if anyone has any specific questions or, um, uh, you know, any needs, anything you'd like to discuss, I'm here. Uh, this uh, disembodied voice is also here for you, Brian. Um, I, I'm Marissa. Uh, I'm the contact that was mentioned earlier um, if you are looking for an attendance certificate. And uh, if you do have any questions about any of the products, please do post them in the Q&A or in the chat. We are happy to answer them. Uh, even if you just want to see something up a little closer, um, Brian is in the room and... Um, 
Uh, Ali, I see that you're asking to uh, get an email in regards to liquid collection container options. We can absolutely do that for you. No problem. Thank you so much for that. Definitely. Um, we'll reach out after. <laughs> we'll reach out after the program. No problem. Um, if there is any other questions or any more information you'd like, um, Brian, in the meantime, uh, uh, Bree would like to see the product info on the sign holder on the rectangular cube slim bin. <laughs> this one, uh, yes, that one. <laughs> uh, well, they'd love some more info series. on that. <laughs> yep, that's part of our spectrum series. Uh, basically, you have the bin, uh, a liner internal, a lid with restrictive options. So you can have circle, circle slot, which we call mixed, a full opening. Uh, the liquid that I talked about. Uh, so there's lots of options and then shapes as well, which allow it for a modular system. Whereas going off topic, the meso, it's a, it's a non-modular system, you know, three uh, stream, you have each individual liner inside, signage labels and everything. The nice thing with these units is sign frames are also an option. So it's a matter of, you can add this after the fact, have the spectrum series but it, it literally just slips on the back of the unit um, signage is customized or we have stock options it basically gets inserted in lid off sorry for the banging with the mic the bin go, or the lid goes on the frame and the lid is then secure so super easy can be added after the fact if you already have the spectrum series um, we do have other options when you get into the ellipse side things. There is a rounded for two ellipse units together. Um, another option, people do that way and use this sign frame this way. So then you don't have as large of a footprint sticking out. So label would just be put on the front. Again, lots of options here. Fantastic. Thank you so All much, right Brian. <laughs> <laughs> you can hear the quality of the material every time you move it around. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to uh, tell us a little bit more about maybe the waste watchers that are just uh, almost off camera on the side there? I know you can wheel them in well, there for us. I have these on dollies so they yeah. can or move into the camera. So again, optional. I'll rotate the camera down a little bit just so you can see the dolly system. But again, this would be a Waste Watcher XL, so the larger size, and then our, our standard Waste Watchers. They also come in uh, different, different sizes than what you see here. So there's a full selection in various different uh, capacities. Similar to the Spectrum unit where you're getting, you know, lid options. Again, all customized to your preference. So this would be a full, this would be a lift lid for organics if required so that it be contained. And then a mix recyclables, there's circle, again, various color options, labels as well on every unit, can be customized if you need something specific, but we have our stocked options. And then as well as the sign frames that go along, again, accessory that can be added. Um, and it's a matter of just snapping. It's a little bit different than the spectrum where it slides on these uh, attached to the unit uh, to just a different process. So let me just move that camera back up so my head's not getting cut off. But again, these signs are eight and a half by 11. They can be customized again to your preference. You know, this would not be a stocked option, but we actually added all this uh, at a request. So if you have specific elements for each individual stream, we can do all that as well. And then the dolly, as I said, that's an accessory. Um, it basically, you start off with your base unit and then you expand from there. So this would be, the XL and then two sides uh, for standard to allow that to be movable. But again, a, an accessory that's an option not required. Fantastic. And um, can you, uh, yeah, I know you mentioned it already, but uh, do you mind touching a little bit on uh, our customization options, both in terms of bins and then also colors, signs, graphics, that kind of thing? Definitely. So again, um, this guy's on wheels here. I'll bring another. So we see different options. 
So again, our Aristata line, again, it's on uh, casters right now, uh, not stock like that. That would be an accessory add-on. Uh, stainless steel lid, um, but again, signed frames added after the fact. You could have this bin without the signed frame if required. Um, and then our stocked options. But again, if you have a specific need for logos, a, a stream that you want called out, we can have, we can customize all that to your preference. And then we also get into the full uh, label and wrap if required. We've had some customers, some schools, some uh, stadiums, they wanted logos wrapped on these units. So it's an open uh, canvas as, as I like to say, you know, we can customize stuff to your preference and have labels on the units themselves. So you can make that station, you know, from our stocked options or you can make it your own with your preferences. Fantastic, thank you, Brian. Um, I'll do one last call out for uh, any questions. So far, nothing else has come in. Uh, thank you to those that did send in questions. Um, you mentioned that we are also, um, we're looking into uh, PCR content and, uh, sorry, post-consumer recyclable content and uh, working with um, those kind of materials. Can you talk a little bit about that, Brian? So again, the, uh, the Renegade, which I don't have uh, in the room right now, I think they're being utilized for another meeting, um, but we launched that. It's basically 100% post-consumer uh, material. Um, it would be our Evolve series. I have a slim here. So something, I'm gonna bring up the green one actually. <laughs> and next. So again, we have the Evolve series in our regular catalog, but we just released the uh, Renegade and it's a full size cube, whereas this is just a slim. Um, and again, it has an indoor option, which is another line, but the Renegade is a full uh, covered. Uh, you can have two entrants uh, or up to four on all sides. And again, that can be customized to your preference in terms of the, uh, the opening, the restricted opening. Um, labels can be customized to your preference. Organics is on this one here. Um, and then the nice thing with, with that bin as well, similar to the Evolves, they can have full body signs as well. So we could customize things uh, with logos, with specials that are happening, anything. Um, and then it would be yeah, mounted to the outside of the unit. So there, again, you have an open canvas for advertisement or, or communication. Fantastic. Thank you, Brian. Um, I have not seen any other questions come in. Uh, thank you so much to those who uh, are still on the call and stayed for our product showcase. Thank you, Brian. Uh, fantastic work as always. <laughs> um, and uh, if there's any clothing, closing thoughts you have or any last things you wanted to finish off with, uh, take it away. As I said, thank you again to the panelists and to everyone that came out today. If you have any direct questions that you want to ask, please uh, reach out to one of us. And uh, we have a full sales team, uh, industry-based, so somebody that uh, deals with your industry will reach back out to you. Uh, but yeah, please feel, uh, feel free to reach out to us at any time for any questions, because uh, yeah, we're here for you. <laughs> and there's my email, so please feel free. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Brian. Uh, yes, I did bop his email into the chat there. Uh, if you do have any questions, reach out to our sales team, reach out to Brian, reach out to me, reach out to Alec. Um, and if there's anything you missed from the program that you're looking for, uh, just let us know. Thank you all so much. Uh, we're going to go ahead and end this. And thank you. Thanks again.